Hi, my name is Brian Slater, and I'm a geologist and a collection manager here at the New York State Museum. When most people think about geology, they think about rocks. And when they think about the type of rocks you'd see at a museum, they usually think about things like this. This is a trilobite fossil. And here we have a specimen that's made up of calcite crystals, part of our mineral collection. Now, the rocks that I work with are a little bit different. This is a bedrock core. And it didn't come from a stream bed or a mountaintop. This piece of rock was actually collected from 7,000 feet below the surface while a deep well was being drilled into the earth. Drillers usually use a bit that looks like this. This is called a tricone bit because it has three cones with teeth on them. This is attached to a pipe and the pipe is rotated with the drilling rig. And as this turns, the wheels spin and these teeth grind up the rock, and that's how the hole is drilled. These bits come in many different sizes. This is actually a relatively small one, and this one over here is quite a bit bigger. As you can see, it still has the three cones with the teeth on them, but this one is much bigger, and as this is drilling, it would drill a bigger hole. Sometimes, Drillers have the option of switching to a bit that looks like this. This is a coring bit, and instead of having the teeth that grind up the rock, there's actually little bits of diamond dust along the edge. And as it rotates, it actually carves a cylinder of rock, and that is how we get these bedrock cores. Coring is much more expensive than regular drilling, so they don't do it all the time, only when the drillers or the geologists on site need a rock sample. This is a video of core being removed from the core barrel. It doesn't always come out in one complete piece like this. It often depends on the type of rock being cored. So why are cores so important? Well, a lot of mines and quarries use them to examine the surrounding area to look for ores or the minerals that they're mining. Uh, drillers in the oil and gas industry often use cores to determine what layer their hydrocarbons are located in, the, the oil or the natural gas that they're looking for. So they collect samples so they can analyze them in the lab to find out the quality of the petroleum that they want to produce. Usually the cores that come from quarries are only a few hundred feet long at the most, but the really long cores, the ones that are thousands of feet long and they come from over 10,000 feet below the surface, most of those cores come from the oil and gas industry. A lot of those cores are donated to us when they're done using them. So the mines and the oil companies will often give us the cores when they're done studying them. And that's how the museum has built its collection. We have over 500 cores from all over the state, including at least one core from every county. One of the branches of geology that uses cores is stratigraphy. Stratigraphers study the various layers of sedimentary rock and how they relate to one another. They look for differences between the layers, and they record what order those layers are in. Before the invention of coring, stratigraphers relied on outcrops to study rock layers. An outcrop is a place where the bedrock is exposed at the surface. So places like stream beds, or road cuts, or quarries were some of the only places a stratigrapher could find bedrock to study. And although there's a lot you can learn from these places, they only tell you what's going on at the surface. You still can't be sure quite what's going on deep underground. This is why cores are so useful. With one core, you can get a snapshot of all the rock layers down to the bottom of a well. And when you have multiple cores from different places, you can start to connect these layers across great distances. Now let's look at a part of New York State. We're going to draw a line from Lake Ontario all the way down to the Pennsylvania border and look at this area in cross section. If you could only look at the rocks in outcrops at the surface, this is what you would learn. You can see there are many different rock types, and this makes you wonder, if these layers are supposed to be lying flat, wouldn't all the outcrops have the same rock, like this? And the answer is yes. If the rock layers were lying flat, then all the outcrops would have the same layer, unless you were at the top of a hill or the bottom of a valley that happened to reach the next layer. So the fact that we see all these different rock types tells us that the layers aren't lying flat. They are, in fact, dipping or tilted. That's an important conclusion. And this is why outcrops are still very valuable to geologists. But we still don't know exactly what's going on below the ground. 
Now let's add some wells to the picture. These lines represent places where a well has been drilled. By connecting or correlating the layers we see in these wells, we can get a more accurate picture of what's going on below the ground. This is just one way that geologists use bedrock cores. Some other geologists use them to look for fossils. Some use them to study the environments that these rocks were deposited in. And then other geologists study things called fractures. For example, this piece of core has a fracture running through it. It's this white line right here. And the reason it's white is because this fracture is full of a mineral called calcite. What happened was that this rock broke open millions of years ago, and the crack actually provided a pathway for fluids that were rich in calcium to travel through the rock. And as it did so, it precipitated the calcite mineral. As you can see, cores come in many different diameters. This small core actually came from the mining industry. They were looking for titanium ore, and they really didn't need a large volume of rock. They just needed to know at what depth they could find the ore they were interested in mining. On the other hand, this piece came from a construction project where the Department of Transportation was looking into expanding a road, and they needed a larger volume of rock to determine how strong it is and whether or not they could build the road on top of it. Not only do the cores come in various widths, they also come in various lengths as well. For example, this core that I'm working on now is over 1,000 feet long. The depth here is actually 944 feet. There are 22 boxes laid out, and each box holds 10 feet. So we have 220 feet of core just laying out on these tables right now, and that's a small portion of this entire core. So how big is the New York State Museum's core collection? Well, as I mentioned before, we have over 500 cores from all over the state, and at least one core from each county. But to give you a better idea of how big that collection actually is, we'll have to go to the museum's storage facility to take a look. We're here at the museum's storage facility. It's basically a big warehouse full of all sorts of cool stuff, and one of the things we store here is most of the bedrock core collection. You can see behind me there are large pallets full of these wooden boxes all of these boxes, and more, as you'll see, full of bedrock cores. Typically, when we receive a new donation of core, they aren't in the best shape. They often come to us in these large wooden boxes that are difficult for one person to handle. So part of my job in managing the collection is to rebox these cores into new, smaller boxes while also measuring and labeling them as I go. Because we're reboxing from a longer box to a shorter one, we often run into situations like this where the rock doesn't quite fit into the row where it's supposed to go. This isn't really a problem. In fact, it's something I actually look forward to because that means we get to break some rock. Each row of core needs to be measured to the nearest tenth of a foot. I also use pieces of styrofoam to fill gaps in the box so the rocks don't slide around. The box is then labeled and each row of core is tagged with a unique museum ID number. Now that we're finished reboxing, the next step is to photograph this core.
It might not seem like the most exciting job, reboxing and labeling cores, but there's a lot of work to be done. If you follow me, you can see I won't be finished anytime soon. All the cores you see in cardboard boxes have probably already been addressed, although we do have some donations in cardboard boxes that still need to be measured and labeled. But all the cores that you see in wooden boxes still need to be reboxed and labeled and measured and added to the museum's official database. While I have you here, there's one more core I think you might find interesting. If you remember when I was talking about the different diameters of the drill bits and how they can collect different size cores, this is by far the largest diameter we have. This is a salt core that was collected from central New York, and it's kept in these PVC pipes because it's very moisture sensitive. So this is, I believe, four and a half inches in diameter, and that's pure salt drilled through the thick salt beds in central New York. There are some other things that we can do with the cores as we study them. One of these things is called slabbing. This is when we use a wet rock saw like this one to cut the core lengthwise. By cutting the core in half, we can see a lot of things that we might not see on the outer surface because it's round. On the flat surface, we get a better idea of the bedding planes or the grain size and some other things that just aren't quite as visible around a curved surface. Another thing we can do is collect what's called a plug. These are small samples that are collected from the side of the core, and they can be used for other analyses. We can use the plugs to make things called thin sections. These are very thin slices of rock that we can view under the microscope. With thin sections, you can see each individual grain of rock. You can also see the spaces between the grains, called pores. In this picture, all the pores have been filled with blue epoxy to make them easier to see. Studying these pores is one of my specialties, and I've been part of many projects here at the museum looking at different ways they can be used. For example, there is a process called geologic carbon sequestration where carbon dioxide is captured from large sources like power plants, and instead of venting it into the atmosphere where it contributes to climate change, we can safely inject the CO2 into very deep layers of rock that have a lot of pore space. There are many places all over the world where this is being done, but we haven't been able to find quite the right situation here in New York. Well, that about wraps things up for me. I hope you enjoyed a tour of the New York State Museum's Bedrock Core Collection.